Welcome back to Living in Spokane, Washington. Today, we're covering our fifth video in our first time home buyer series, what buying a house really looks like. This video series has covered all the basics to help you get on the right path towards home ownership, no matter where you are in the process. In previous videos, we have already talked about how to set up a strong financial foundation, how to save for later, a deep dive into credit, and how to fix a variety of financial issues. To round up the series, today's video will walk you through the basics of the home buying process. Be sure to stay till the end of the video that we have all the information you need for your successful financial journey. Welcome back to Living in Spokane, Washington. If you're new here, my name's Hunter McKay and I'm your local real estate broker. Whether you're moving to the area or just looking for more information on buying your first home, you've come to the right place. I'm here to help anytime. Leave me a comment or reach out through the links in the description and I'll make sure you're covered. Before we begin, I wanna emphasize that the information provided in this series is intended for education and entertainment purposes only. I'm a really great real estate broker, but I am not a financial advisor. And it's important to consult with a qualified financial advisor or professional to tailor any recommendations to your specific situation. So please reach out to me directly and I'd be happy to give you a recommendation on who you can speak with. The first step to buying a home, contrary to popular belief, is not going and looking at a bunch of them. I don't know why, I suspect everyone likes that part better than talking about money, but they avoid chatting with their lender. They're like, oh no, I'm sure it's fine. I'm definitely gonna be pre-approved. I have great credit. I have family who's helping me, blah, 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 blah. I honestly don't care. You are wrong. <laughs> I am wrong. I do this for a living and when I evaluate myself, I am wrong about myself because we overstate our expectations about ourselves and we understate the complications because we're human beings. So you go to a lender first and you say, hello lender, I'm thinking about buying a house. Will you please pre-approve me? And then you should shop that lender until you are comfortable with the interest rate and the loan type and the info that you are being given. The interest rate might change depending on if you have locked it in or not yet but you can still chat with the different lenders and find out, do they have an origination rate? Do they have any kind of doc prep fees that are different than everyone else? Can you shop any of their lender fees to see if they're lower? What are they charging you for? And is it actually an apples to apples comparison? A lot of lenders like to say, oh, I'm gonna get you a fantastic rate. Okay, how much of my money are you using to buy me that fantastic rate? Are you using my money or your money as an exception? These are all questions that a really good real estate broker is gonna know how to help guide you through, but you have to have the conversation with a mortgage broker before you go and start looking at houses. We are not going to be happy to show you 12 different homes if you haven't been pre-approved because what if you fall in love with one that's twice what you can afford? It's going to ruin the experience for everyone and make it really hard for you to be happy. There are lots of lending companies out there that will say, we'll give you a really good rate and a special discount if you work with the broker that we recommend. I would only recommend working with those people if you actually like them and trust them. A lot of the time I get someone that says, hey, I wanna work with you, but such and such promised me that if I worked with their preferred partner, they'll give me a discount. All that tells me is that they're already charging somewhere more money than someone else. I don't know who or what yet, but there is a mortgage broker somewhere who can work with me to honor the same commitment that that other person is making. We're all individual contractors. We all have access to the same types of situations and money and access to people. It's just a matter of do we know how to use our resources well enough and do we care enough about our clients and can we spin the margin well enough in order to get them what they're asking? Great example, I had a client come to me and say, I'd like to work with Veterans United, but they say that I have to work with their preferred broker in order to get the rate that they want. And I said, great, what's the interest rate? They said it's 6.25. I said, awesome, let me go chat with my lender. And if I can honor that 6.25 rate, then will you just come work with us because you've already indicated that you like our service better. And he said, sure, but how are you going to do that? And I said, don't worry about it, let me figure it out. On the back end, I knew that it was just an exception. Someone somewhere is making less money in order to commit this lower rate to the buyer. And so I had to go call the lender and say, are you willing to honor this rate and make less money? Coincidentally, he said yes. And so the client is very happy. But don't just trust what someone is telling you. Ask them to explain why is there this relationship? Is there some kind of quid pro quo? 
are you using my money or their money in order to get this rate? Everyone is gonna make you promises, but anyone should be able to explain every detail of where the money is coming and going from because this isn't magic, it's just real estate. Once you've selected your broker and mortgage team, it's time to start home shopping. At this point in time, you know the professionals that you're working with. You've vetted them and you trust their guidance. Additionally, you already know what you're pre-approved for. At this point in time, you should have a good understanding of what the interest rate is that you're going to be suffering under and what that means as far as monthly payment. All of this should make it really simple that when you're looking at a home going, do I like it? You can figure out with your agent really quickly, can I afford it? And from there, you really wanna look at how competitive is the market that I'm in. If you're in an easy market, like we had this winter, where everyone was kind of freaked out about rates going up, everyone hoped the market was gonna fall apart, there was less competition. And so homes had more time on market. You could offer differently than you would, say, this weekend, where the sun is shining and despite rates being up from this winter, everyone has finally said, okay, I guess the market isn't going anywhere. And so our spring fervor is here and we're back to low inventory and multiple offers. So you really have to ask your agent, what's the market doing right now? How do I stay competitive? What are the things that are going to be expected of me that other people are doing? And what can I do that's extra and above if I run into a home that I really like? Figure out, is it time frame for inspection? Is it the amount of money that you put down for the earnest money? Is it maybe that you do an info only inspection and say, I'll take the property as is if I'm satisfied with it. There are so many different things that you can do to strengthen your offer that isn't just offer more money. But sometimes you will have to offer more money. And again, even more than list price in certain situations, you just have to ask your agent, what's expected and how do I win? Once you found the perfect house and you submit a fantastic offer, let's work with the best case scenario. You win. Your broker calls and says, hey, congrats, we have mutual acceptance. What's next? Usually you'll have two to three days to deposit earnest money. You'll want to double check your contract and make sure you have that time frame specified. But earnest money is the contribution towards closing that shows that you're bound to the seller. It's the first time that you submit money and it prohibits the seller from reselling the property to someone else during this time period. If you have, say, a 30-day escrow, you might still have contingencies or financing periods that you have to go through. The earnest money is the thing that holds and binds everyone to the contract and keeps everyone in check. If you bail on the contract outside of your contingencies, you're gonna lose your earnest money. But if you use your contingencies appropriately and withdraw because of one of them, your earnest money may still be protected. So just think about those things when you're chatting with your agent and make sure to have all of your contingencies planned in such a way that you can meet your obligations and keep your earnest money protected. After the earnest money is deposited, we're usually right on top of the inspection timeframe. You or your agent will be scheduling that as soon as mutual acceptance is given. You will work to get a third party inspector to come and take a look at the home and make sure inside your inspection period, you get a full report. That way you can either go back to the seller and negotiate repairs or let them know that everything is good to go and you're moving forward. Certain circumstances, you might find something so terrible in inspection that you wanna pull out of the deal completely. And if you've written your contract appropriately, that's totally within your right. But again, make sure that you're having all of these discussions upfront with your agent, that way you can have the right expectations. Once the inspection is satisfied and both parties are comfortable with the agreement and moving forward, then the appraisal is usually ordered. That's something that you do directly with your lender. And so you'll call and let them know, hey, we're ready to go through the inspection, we're done. And now you can call the appraiser and order that. You don't want to order the appraisal before you have agreement from your inspection proceedings because it kind of shows the seller that you're more serious about moving forward than you are about negotiating the repairs that you might have been asking for. If you're a seller and you get the re request for, say, $5,000 in closing costs because of repairs, but you already know that the appraisal was scheduled for 9 a.m. this morning, are you really going to feel compelled to give them that $5,000 credit? Or might you play hardball and say, nah, I know that you already gave the appraisal order and so we're not gonna move forward. You can, you can just go forward at this point. And a lot of the time that does happen. So just be careful about the order of sequence. Once the appraisal is ordered, that's also done by a third party inspector, usually one hired by a bank or a, an appraisal management company. Once that value comes back, hopefully the value comes in at contract price. That way you can move forward. If it comes back below contract price, you have to go back to the seller and renegotiate. Or the seller might say, 
tough cookies. You agreed to pay the price. And at that point, you'd have to come up with the extra cash differenced between the appraised value and the contract price. Or if you didn't want to, you would have the opportunity to withdraw at that time period. Again, assuming your agent writes the addendum correctly. You'll notice I keep saying, assuming your agent does this correctly. You really shouldn't assume your agent is doing something correctly. Go work with an agent who is going to do it correctly and has done so because they do this all the time. And so that's where having an agent like myself who closes 100 to 150 transactions a year can be a really good thing because I have the repetition necessary to not drop the ball on some really key moments that keep you protected during this escrow. In a perfect world, everything goes great. The seller agrees to the inspection repairs, the appraisal gets ordered on time, the report comes back, and at this point, you've probably been going through underwriting with your lender where they've been requesting a bunch of documents. And in a really good scenario, the appraisal is like the last thing that has to come in. At that point, everything will be reviewed, the value will be approved, and your loan docs will get disclosed. At that point, you'll get your closing disclosures. And as long as those closing disclosures are out greater than three days ahead of closing, you're gonna close on time. You will get a closing uh, call scheduled and the uh, closer will have you come in physically and sign all of your documents. Most up until this point have been done virtually or digitally, but you will be required to come in and wet ink sign all of your title and uh, escrow paperwork along with the deed for the house. At that point, you will record and close, usually within 24 hours of your signing, but some people choose to sign ahead of time, just depending on schedule. And then your keys will be released to you by 9 p.m. on the final day of escrow. I know this was a lot to cover, and the home buying process can seem pretty daunting, so if there's any questions you have that didn't get answered, please comment and leave a like below, and we'll be happy to get them addressed in another video or send you a private comment.